Today is the first lecture over a five week course, playing this personality. So agenda for the program. First week, introduction and history of psychometrics. Next week, personality and context and also change. So as previously was mentioned, personality does change. So next week is all gonna be about this. On the 26th, it's gonna be okay. If personality changes, can we coach it and develop it? And if so, how? So that's gonna be the program for the fourth, uh, third. Fourth week is no man or woman is an island. So therefore, it's really important to know how personalities interact with each other. So for example, you know, how high extroverts might some take, take introversion as a sign of rejection because they're not getting that emotional expression they're expecting. And how sometimes introverts might see high extroversion as being needy and things like that. And most importantly, let's say if you live or work or both with somebody with quite a different personality to yours, how over time these personalities rub off on each other. So how we change each other. Because there's wonderful phrases like, some people bring out the best in you, some people bring out the worst in you. And that definitely has to do with personality in my opinion. And week five, we're just keeping it open. So what's gonna happen today? So we already covered a bit about introductions and getting to know each other, because this is a week five week program. So hopefully we'll make some connections. You never know what might happen. You meet some other fellow psychometric aficionados and not everybody's interested in personality. Strange that. We're also gonna talk about history of personality assessments and different models. So type, trait, disc, big five, all of that. Good. And then most importantly, there will be shenanigans oh. throughout. So oh. anecdotes uh, and, it. and then, so that's the program about me. So I call myself chief neuroticism officer because somebody needs to fly the flag for negative emotional affect. I'm obsessed with personality, as you can tell, and just some numbers. The best way I can count, I have probably done about five to 7,000 individual feedback sessions, as well as probably about 100 team builds, worked for three different publishers, qualified in a couple of dozens of psychometrics. Um, I'm still on my first marriage, <laughs> And it's probably because I use two psychometrics as part of the proposal process. Because I believe leaving to one assessment for such high consequence decision is purely irresponsible. And I can definitely vouch for what they say. Marriage is psychological. One is a psycho, the other one's logical. I'm the psycho. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. I'm glad you liked it. Uh, so it's one of these rare psychology jokes which are actually funny to the general population. So definitely a keeper. And um, still just have one child. She's still a pilot study, data is being gathered. Um, but what I'm curious about is what brought you here. So we're using a tool called Menti, which allows everybody to participate. And if you can go to menti.com and type in 67 55 44 7, and you can do this on your phones, on your laptops, tablets, messenger pigeons are not compatible, but everything else pretty much is. So just curious, what sort of things get you to spend? Sorry, Nikita, w would you mind repeating the numbers? Of course, you just Thank across you. the top. So it's 67, 55. Sorry, oh. I do see, thank you. <laughs> no worries. Excellent. So, enjoy the post. I haven't studied deep personality, so looking forward to learning from you. Uh, good luck with that. I'm not sure you're going to learn anything. Hopefully, a bit entertained. Uh, wanted to learn about personality. Graduate one and a half years ago. Feel I have lost touch with psychology. I can resonate with that. I also there was about a year between graduation and me studying masters. But um, yeah. There's always time to get back because psychology is kind of a vacation rather than a job in my experience. My extroverted curiosity, FOMO personality. Self-awareness with an acronym, gotta love it. 
intrigued personality and interplay of personality types, psychometric tools, curiosity and intrigue, did an MSc in Oxford Psych, learning more about personality, WebEx brought you here. Considering we're on Zoom, I'm really intrigued how WebEx brought you here, but uh, hey, mysteries of the internet. Trying to educate team on personality. If you want to uh, a good educational piece on personality, if you go to YouTube and type in crush course, personality assessments, it's a brilliant 15 minute video, just like a complete, ah, it's just brilliant. No words can describe it. Uh, introduction to personality. If you want something more in depth, there's a great book on Audible called Why You Are Who You Are by Leary. It's great courses. It's brilliant. And by the way, you will receive all those references in um, email through Eventbrite in the next couple of days, along with the recording of this. So if you just can't wait or can't sleep tonight, no need to take notes, but feel free to do so. So, excellent. Quite a few curiosity, personality affects everyone, absolutely. So moving on, just a little bit about you. So you and personality psychometrics, do you use them all the time? Then you can click on Ron Burgundy here, or are you qualified and occasionally use it? Or you just completed them? Or are psychometrics, what is this magic? So we have a, ooh, standard distribution is forming, yay. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So we have already 46. Let's wait till we get to 50. Uh -huh. Right. So we have a, a nice distribution going. So I'm just curious to hear from a couple of you. So for example, people who collect on psychometrics, what is this magic? What's your general impression of psychometrics? When people mention that word. Mm. Chat. Testing ability or performance. Textbooks answer. Any <laughs> other associations? Is it not like astrology? Well, all I can say is that our profession has a long lineage. And you know, so there's nothing. Astrology. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing wrong with astrology. Look, there's 12 types. And all of them have a good side and all of them have a bad side. Okay. So actually, to me, astrology is actually more balanced than quite a few psychometrics when looking at per individual differences. So, as oh, by the way, Dean, what's your star sign? Uh, Taurus. Oh, that's such a typical thing of a Taurus to say, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um. Although my daughter did tell me that, that apparently this year they found out that they got it all wrong and there's the signs are all out by a bit. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether to believe or not. Because that would make, uh, me, it would make me a Gemini and I, I'm really not sure I want to be a Gemini. Hey man, we're learning about personality change. Maybe we can work with star sign change as well. Yeah. Anything is possible. And I'm just curious, considering quite a few of you use psychometrics, what tools do you use? So what psychometrics in particular? Well, I use the MBTI extensively, the Enneagram, and I have also used Big Five. So those three, thank you. Um, that's a, such a nice combination, Kailash. Am I pronouncing the name correctly, by the way? Oh, yes, you are, in fact, spot on. Thank you. Yes. So do you use the tools uh, alongside each other or do you use one or the other? Alongside, a combination of type-based and trait-based instruments through a journey. So they are used, uh, they're quite spaced out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. So w what, for example, from your perspective, those different tools bring to each other? 
uh, working with innate differences is uh, the short journey in which I use Enneagram and then the MBTI. Mm -hmm. Then when we speak about, we use the 270 item version of the mm -hmm. Neat Pie, the mm -hmm. big five. And mm -hmm. I use that to speak about enduring patterns of behavior and the shadow region of the 30 dimensions uh, that, uh, you know, we are able to elicit, I'm able to elicit through the big five. So that's how it is used through a journey. Oh, that's wonderful. So they complement each other. That's right. Yeah, sure. And that's one of the most important things that n neither either of these tools are, you know, the right one or anything like this. It's A, how you use it. And you can get complementary things from different tools depending on how they're structured. And the journey is a beautiful way to phrase it. Because quite often, you know, sometimes these debates can turn into beer spilling conversations in Brighton with a certain person called Richard type versus trait. And um, it doesn't lead anywhere really. Some beer gets spilled, but at least there's conversation. But it is important. I think it's not either or this tool or the other, it's how they can, com can be combined. Right, so we have a nice uh, distribution of, uh, yeah, Richard, you know I do. Uh, I do love a good debate about personality. I mean, I'm sad like this, but hey, nobody's perfect. Uh, so we have quite a few different pro products. And now I just want to ask you about your level of experience in use of psychometrics. So have you been using them for around 20 years, less than a year, 10 to 20, 5 to 10, 1 to 5? So we have one response less than a year. Oh, 20 years plus. We already have like 20 responses, 31. Mm. Nice response pattern here. So what's really important here is that we all have something to share, whether we're just getting to use psychometrics in our beginning of our journey, or we use them for 20 years plus. But the main thing is we have about 100 people on this call right now. And between us, let's give a rough estimate. We probably have, I don't know, four or 500 years of use of psychometry. But the main thing here is that on this call, we have more experience in psychometrics than any of us can aim to get in a lifetime. So I think one of the key things about the next, this session and the next four, uh, it's what's really important is that we try to harness this intelligence and facilitate our experiences and share. So we'll be going through quite a few different models and um, tools in, in this lecture. And if you have an anecdote of how you used it or something from your career or something you heard, just please jump in and share. Because it's by sharing and building on this collective intelligence of experience, I think we'll be able to get a best experience. Because otherwise, you're just going to have a, a Russian with a girl name ranting at you about personality for the next hour. And I'm fine with that. But maybe we can make it a little bit better. So, and I love this little gif. So we're going to talk about personality. Especially it's like a, a black circle and rage and fear. But I think rage and fear is actually part of personality, especially if you look at neuroticism. But we'll get onto that. So if you could not use the word personality, what word would you use? I hear some furious typing there. Right. So let's wait till 10 answers. Perfect. Character, behavior, nature, your typicalities, I do is synchronies. Ah, oh, identity, patterns of behavior. So many wonderful things. Character is definitely one of the highest and behavior as well and nature. See, this is what I find why I love personality so much. Because to me, at the same time, it's probably one of the most studied scientifically areas of psychology. There's tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of articles, studies, books on personality, which are peer reviewed from top academic institutions. But we also don't really know what we're talking about. 
at the same time. And at the same time, when we can kind of go back to the previous research that was mentioned by Joel about personality and fit and why it correlates so little with uh, satisfaction sometimes or engagement or performance, and we say it's not important. But when we talk about personality, sometimes it's a crucial decision factor. Like I fell in love with them because of their personality or you know, I really don't like their personality. Or we attribute personality to dogs. We can say, my dog has a great personality or even like furniture. It's a, ooh, this is chair with character. Uh, it's a very ephemeral construct. And what's fascinating, if we look, for example, at eulogy statements, it's basically a personality statement for the most part. He was a gentle and kind man. So what's interesting is how other people see your personality also survives you even after we die. So we have something very ephemeral, interesting, and not, it's hard to put your finger on it. But to me, the best way I can describe it is, you know, the, the fable of the five blind people touching an elephant. I couldn't find a graphic. It's, it's much better graphical because when you talk it through, it actually sounds really ridiculous, but hey, that's just my self-consciousness on neuroticism. So basically, they're all blind and you know, they touch, one touches the trunk and they go, oh, this is really soft. As one's touching the foot, you know, this is very hard. Other person touching the tail, this is fluffy, but they're all touching the same elephant. So to me, whenever people use the term values, character, behavior, style, spirit, preference, EQ, dark side, you name it, we're all touching the same elephant, but we don't really know what this elephant is. And to me, this is a phenomenon of individual differences. So all of these words can be used to describe that phenomenon. And we have tried to grapple with this for quite a long time, for thousands of years, actually. And this is what we're going to dive into. But actually, we don't need models of personality because I can ask you a simple question. How would you describe your personality? So you can just type it in. It can be one word, five words, an essay, anything you want. Just type in whatever you want to do. Complex, nice. And an exclamation mark as well. Interesting, good. Conflicting, introvert, compassionate, blended. Pessimist, anxious, blank, quick, blunt, quick thinker. Well, I can definitely resonate with that. Uh, various layers depending on who I'm dealing with. Hmm, sounds very emotionally intelligent. Driven to help others. Caring and friendly, but timid sometimes. Considerate and humble. Unstable, yep. Been known to do that as well. Empathetic, oh, wonderful. So we have all a self-construct or a self-narrative. We don't need a model for this. Because if you ask somebody, how do you feel? Or how would you describe yourself? We can describe that even without a model, even people who haven't come across psychometrics know what we were talking about when we say personality. However, we can see, for example, extroverted, introverted, those are um, typology terms we'll get into. So you can see how some of the language of personality model has sipped into the vocabulary of every day. So any reflections looking at all of these descriptions? Thomas, I noticed you unmuted yourself. Ah, I was just, I thought you were going to say something. They're more like adjectives, nicely observed. And um, yeah, and we'll get into the psycholexical approach a little bit sooner. Relatively positive, yep. That's also true, but some people actually describe themselves as actually quite anxious pessimistic, or here, anxious, but focused, uh, which is also a really interesting perspective. So, yeah, there's a lot of words to do with personalities. Others are blended, some concrete, yep. So even this kind of strengths of who am I differs person by person. Some people are much more adaptable. Some people say, you know, this is who I am, like it or leave it. So that also depends. 
So where did all this fascination start? Actually, any guesses where personality assessments started? Um, uh, Nikita, uh, Richard here. Hey, Richard. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I'm just trying to guess from the image, uh, uh, kind of uh, China, the Great Wall. So I'm thinking Confu early Confucianist practice practices. Yeah, to an extent, it was around, I guess, the same time. It was actually, um, there are several mentions. So apparently, and like all of this comes from sources and grapevines because there's no like definitive book on history of psychometrics. Yes. As far as I'm aware. So it actually was like the Buddha writers laid down five factors irrespectable of genders to help to select with uh, elephant trainers. And they said, you know, it was confidence, wisdom, diligence, sincerity, and health. And then the Han Imperial dynasty wanted to select people for civil service. So actually civil service in ancient China, this is where assessment started, interestingly enough. And uh, let me just bring up because I forget the details, da, 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 da. memory is not perfect. Right, so in the high dynasty China, it developed test batteries, 206 BC to 220. Two or more tests used in conjunctions. Test topics included civil law, military affairs, agriculture, revenue, and geography. And in Ming, Ming dynasty, so that's around like 14th century, multi-stage testing processes with testing centers equipped with testing booths. So in Middle Ages, we already had assessment centers. BPS only recently published guidelines on how to run them. So some <laughs> finally caught up. Um, uh, BPS is a British Psychological Society. So assessments have started a long way ago. Then we go to ancient Greece. So Hippocrates, he created this, you know, the four humors that it had to do in your blood, etc., which defines your temperament. And it was a mix of all four. So, so he did create the kind of the four um, quadrant or the four colors or whatever you wish, perspective model. But it was about a mix. So it was the phlegm, yellow bile, black bile, and blood. And that was ages ago. But what's interesting right now, recent studies show that, for example, we can sort of get close to your personality some traits of it, we can track from your blood. So he was onto something and your saliva as well, especially levels of testosterone and how it's correlated with extroversion. So we're gonna skip ahead a little bit. There was also a dude called Samuel Pepys. Uh, he kept one of the most detailed diaries about middle ages. Well, not, I mean, Renaissance, around 70th century. Uh, I'm not a history buff. Let's say around 17th century, he noticed in Royal Navies there was a problem that because of your class, lineage, etc., you got selected for being a captain and you might have not been that well suited towards it. So he proposed that actually maybe we can use some assessments to help to select the best candidate for the job. Apparently, just today I read somewhere that Vikings used to do the same. So if an heir was not up to the scratch to replace a chief, they put the heir aside and profile somebody with some ability assessments, et cetera, to see who was best for the job. So, you know, Vikings, Royal Navy, they practiced with assessments. But then we go to modern history of psychometrics and by modern, I mean the end of 19th century. So towards the end of 19th century, we have James McKee and Cattell. Now there's gonna be two Cattells in the next 10 minutes. As far as I know, not related to each other, Raymond and James McKean. So James McKean Cattell, he was looking around at the end of 18th century on what was happening in the world of personality. And there've been several things happening. So one, we all know about Charles Darwin, but few people know about his cousin, Sir Francis Galton. Now Galton there looked at what his cousin was doing and he was like, I can apply this. So he was an applied Darwinist and um, he basically started working on uh, trying to measure everything that he could. Oh, somebody doesn't like Cambridge by the looks of it. Uh, and uh, basically what he started doing is trying to measure everything about people. Uh, you know, length of arms, you know, what tone of sound you could pick up, anything. 
And he gave us the standard deviation and regression, some of the basic principles of psychometry. But he took psychometrics way too far, and he was also a really keen eugenicist. Because in the beginning, especially at the end of 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, malpractice of psychometrics and eugenics went quite close together. This is why in psychometry, we don't like to remember the first half of 20th century. But if you're interested in psychometrics, it's important to know the past. And there was some really bad practice. So we have Francis Galton running about measuring everything. We also have a guy called Gustav Fencher. So he founded psychophysics. So it's a quantitative relation between sensation and stimuli. He also had really bad eyesight because he stared into the sun too long. He was literally interested in studying the effect of looking into the sun. So he overdid it. So next time you, you remember your mother or you're telling your children, don't look into the sun too long. You can go, let me tell you about a story about Gustav Fencher. So we had Gustav running about. And then we also have William Maximilian Wund. So he was a physician, physiologist, and a philosopher. So he was the first person to note psychology as a science apart from biology and philosophy. And he was the father of experimental psychology. So he founded the first laboratory uh, for psychological research in the University of Leipzig in 1879. And first, the first academic journal of psychological research, the Philosophy Student, I can't pronounce that. And he also is accredited with being the first person to call himself a psychologist. So then our main hero, James McKean Cattell comes along and he goes, well, this is really interesting. You know, we can synergize Wundt's psychophysics and Galton's mathematical approach to measurement. And he was looking around and it's like, where can I park myself? Which academic institution will have me? And he set his eyes on Cambridge, but the Senate in Cambridge proposed what he was proposing to set up a laboratory to measure was, what was it? An abomination, because it would propose to put the human soul on a pair of scales. So he was not given a full laboratory, but he had a mate who already had a place in a different laboratory. I think it was a physics or mathematics, probably physics laboratory in Cambridge. And they gave him a little spot. So actually the first laboratory of psychometrics started in Cambridge. So the Cambridge Psychometric Center, which you can still attend and provides fantastic research and opportunities for training goes all the way back to that laboratory was that James McKean Cattell set up. And yeah, that's quite fun. So before we move into 20th century, would anybody like to add anything that they know about the past of psychometrics or any little anecdotes? Uh, well, this is Vijay Pandey. There is a book in India called Arthashastra, which mm -hmm. is about economics, basically, the loose translation. Mm -hmm. That has very systematic account of selecting employees for different levels. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like the whole chapter is dedicated how you should hire people who are working in spy services, how you should hire military people, how you should hire civil servants, how you should hire personal servants and all, everything. So I, I think it provides quite comprehensive system of uh, a selection system for the, the entire government. Excellent. And when was it written? It was written, I think, 400 BC or something. It, it is from Acharya Kautilya's time. So it's, it's quite old book. Uh, I, I, I'm not very sure about the dates. So Maybe I'll, I'll just send it later in, in, in the chat box after checking it. Oh, excellent. That's brilliant. Thank you for that, Vijal. Yeah. So, and mm -hmm. Yes, Kailash. Sorry, Nikita. Just wanted to also mention while you were speaking about the history of mm -hmm. psychometrics and you spoke about the four humors, mm -hmm. also the Ayurveda typifies uh, body types into Vata, Pitta, and Kapha, and uh, while it was for diagnosis, but you can also elicit uh, unique and enduring uh, 
patterns of personality by typifying people into those three categories. So that is also, and that was uh, also many, many years ago. I can't remember how many years BC, but very old. So just wanted to add that. Mm, fantastic. I, I would love to be like, you know, two and a half thousand years ago, or what have you, in one of those debates. You know, did you read this book? No, I'm practicing Ayurvedic medicine. Ah, <laughs> I wonder if they had similar debates that you have tri trait and type nowadays. <laughs> Brilliant, but thank you so much for sharing that. Um, any more for any more before we jump to recent history? All right, as a high extrovert, I have a rule of thumb. Whenever I say any questions, I count to 10 inside my head before continuing. Because my natural setting is any questions, good, moving on. But then people don't ask questions. So as we move on, we have Sigmund Freud. Uh, because Sigmund was an interesting chap, as we all know. And he basically proposed ego, id, and superego, which can be debated, actually has to do with personality. Also, the whole hysteric stuff connects with that as well. Now, then we also have Carl Gustav Jung, who actually, through thousands of sessions with his patients, identified those key personality archetypes or types. For example, introversion, extroversion. But sometimes people forget that he also identified ambiversion. So he said, nobody is a pure introvert or an extrovert that person will belong to the mental institution. And uh, the way he defines in one of his books is think of a tiger. Tiger has both paws, left and the right, but he still tends to strike from one of those, the stronger one, but doesn't mean he doesn't have left another one. So you can be ambiverted with an extroverted preference or ambiverted with an introverted preference, but you still have both sides. And most people are in the middle and flexible. So yeah. Is there any kind of keen type-based practitioners on the call by chance? Hmm. Yep, I, I do a lot of type work, but not using MBTI. I don't like that tool. I see. What tool do you use? Uh, I have a tool which uh, it's it's not a standardized questionnaire kind of thing, but it, it explores into the psychological functions. Mm -hmm. and the strength of the function. So you, it operates from that perspective. Uh, preference versus function, like what is your preference and then how much it is developed in terms of those eight psychological functions. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's more kind of a therapeutic tool rather than a questionnaire. Hmm. Nice. And that's another very important thing to know that today we're talking about more about models of personality such as type-based tools are based on the model by Jung. Carl Gustav never created a psychometric assessment. It's other people who created assessments based on his theory. And similarly with Jung or Big Five, all these tools are based on models. They're not the models themselves. And everybody has a slightly different take on the original model. So if you're a practitioner of several tools around the same model, it's important to know those key differences and not to take them for granted. Any other thoughts on uh, typology of personality? I think typology is something which is deeply embedded. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and Jung put it very nicely actually. Uh, it's like from the type, everything flowers, everything manifests and if, if let's say if there is some, the way we do and about, you know, in biology, we go back to genes that everything comes from that. In, in, psycho in psychology, the psychological world, we can go, go back to everything from that basic type from where everything evolves. So for me, like your type interacts with the environment and gives birth to your traits. So mm -hmm. it, it happens like that. I see. So there's kind of the underlying layer. Yeah. Excellent. So yes, it's about this kind of layering and seeing how they connect. But 
yeah and to me whenever people think about Jung I always think of Alps because he loved those things so then we also have Roshark I call him the original hipster and if you actually google Roshark right now and see a picture of him you'll know why because he looks like a hipster but a hundred years ahead of his time but sadly that he actually I, I don't think he ever even saw a publication of his book he actually died quite young and then Roshark test has evolved and yeah it's definitely an interesting assessment but it relies more on projective psychometry so it's a lot of the questionnaires we previously mentioned rely on self-report so you rate a few questions about yourself and it can also exist as a 360 so people rate questions about you but this one is quite different because in this assessment you're presented with the line and then you need to see what you're seeing say what you're seeing so it kind of tries to detect your personality by what you project onto the stimuli rather than how you see yourself, which is also an interesting way to go about it, but it's nice, well and alive, and it's still widely used, which is also curious. Then we have Dr. William Marston, the creator of DISC. So he also created a model of personality. He also created Wonder Woman, and he was one of kind of the chief protagonist of the lie detector test. So he's a very interesting character. So if you're interested in Marston, you can either A, read his book, Psychology of Normal People or Emotions of Normal People, which is always interesting when you use the term normal in the title. And there's also a good book, uh, not good. There's a film about him as well. Usually it was available on Netflix till recently. So just type in Marston film, um, highly recommend it. But then again, he only proposed the model. And originally, D stood for dominance and S stood for submissiveness. So he was really curious about how some people want to dominate others and other people want to submit to those who dominate them. And he believes the true aspiration of a person was to be lovingly dominated. He was an interesting chap. And if you think Freud books have a lot to do about sex, read Marston book. And because um, everything is relative. Now, we get on to Gordon Allport, which we all remember, but we forget Henry Odbert. I think it was Odbert, right? Or did I make a mistake? See, that's an issue. Like, you know, everybody knows Neil Armstrong, but the second guy, huh. So, but basically these two chaps probably had nothing better to do in 1920s and they decided to create a personality assessment because, and there's quite a few anecdotes of why it was created. So some people say it was created because they were both really inspired by Binet and uh, what the French were doing with IQ. So they wanted to create something for personality. Another anecdote is that Allport went to see no one other than Sigmund Freud himself. And he was asking Sigmund about this little child he saw on a train and this mother was overly protective of him about not touching anything dirty or something like that. And then Sigmund asked him, you know, was this little boy you? And all poor just like, no, man. Sometimes it's just, it's not that. It's just sometimes an event, it's just an event. So he wanted to study personality like in a given point in time. And the way they went around this is the lexical approach or psycholexical as it's also known. So they picked up the dictionary which English dictionary, it had about 400,000 words in it. And they picked out every word that they felt had to do with personality. And overall, they picked out 17,935 or something like that. So close to 18,000 words, like anxious, worrisome, excited, tra ta 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 And then they tried to start grouping those words together. So which words went together? Like, you know, if you're anxious and worrisome, does this mean that you're likely to be both or neither. And it started a long process. And it started such a long process, it finished in the 80s, but we still have some ground to cover. Oh, my. Aha. So who do we have in the meantime? Well, we have Catherine Briggs and Isabel Briggs Myers, not forgetting them. And though I did say this is about models and Myers-Briggs is a tool based on typology. It did add some more types 
and why this has a suspicious gentleman looking over the paper. Because recently I read on the internet, so it must be true. The first use of MBTI was with the OSS or the Secret Service in US in 1940s, the selection of spies. So that's what they were trying to do. And what's really interesting is that this tool has been widely successful and widely used and we'll definitely debate why it might have been so. But it's definitely another product that was created in the 40s, which is very much alive today. Here's the second Cattell, and this time it's Raymond. So what Raymond did, he picked up the original psycholexical paper of Allport, and he started cracking at it with his students. So he started actually giving assessments, people rating himself a bit convoluted and quite, you can challenge it basically. There was, they picked a sample of hundred people and they rated their behaviors. That was one of the key things that they did, which was interesting because they turned the descriptive terms of self-report kind of thing to actually how you would describe people's behaviors and how they would show up. And he was an interesting chap and they analyzed all that data by hand. So the factor analysis was by hand. And the reasons why I have a dining room table here is because Cattell daughter can remember in her childhood for years, for years, their dining room table downstairs was covered by factor analysis papers. So because we're factor analyzing data by hand. So the dining table was out for years, but it resulted to the creation of 16 PF. So it's 16 personality factors. So it's an interesting little model and it created the 16 PF psychometric tool, which is very well used today. And it has been updated so many different times, but he also created his own vocabulary to describe some terms. So if you want to chuckle or just curiosity, just Google 16 PF original and look at what words he has used because he said, if we're gonna create new personality constructs, we shouldn't be using the words of the past, but we should create some new words. And that's what he did. Right. Not forgetting Timothy Leary. He was a curious cat in the 50s and 60s. So he was heavy into personality research. He actually published a really decent book in the 50s and he created the first circumplex. So circumplex is like two charts crossed over each other on personality. He said, tell me two things about a man and I shall tell you everything you need to know about them. Their need for power and their need for love. Hmm. Now come to think of it, that's quite similar to what Marston was saying, but anyways. But the main thing is he created the psychometric tool. Then he paired up with Richard Alpert in Harvard and they got kicked out for giving psilocybin to postgraduate students when they only had permission to give psychedelic, uh, no, no, they gave psychedelic drugs to undergraduate students one they had only permission to give to postgraduates. Back in the 60s, man, uh, and they got kicked out of Harvard. They, uh, Richard Alpert was the first professor to get kicked out of Harvard in 20th century. And, uh, and what was really fun is, well, basically then Timothy was caught transporting a whole bunch of illegal substances, put it this way, and found guilty. Now, there's a thing called social desirability effect in psychology. And this is basically when people alter their answers, like on the questionnaire to get a job, that they look more favorable. So more likely to be selected, you know, best foot forward. Now, what, what the irony with Timothy is that after he got sentenced in that particular state, they were administering a personality assessment to define what a risk to society you were. So which level of prison you need to go into? Now, guess what? Timothy got administered his assessment that he created in 1950s. So he altered his answers to get into the minimal security prison and it gets better, from which he organized an escape to South America with the help of Black Panthers and Weather Underground. Man, those were the days, right? Of psychometrics. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a very interesting chap and definitely worth a look in. Uh, so in 1970s, we come to Costa and McRae. So Costa and McRae, two chaps, they were really interested in studying how 
personality changes across lifespan. And they were looking around the 1970s and they couldn't find any assessments that really floated their boat. So they were like, let's create one. Uh, and what then happened is they, the story goes, they got the original kind of data set from 1940s and 20s of Allport. And then they shoved all of that in the computer. But now can't find any references just with her down the grapevine over too many pints at conferences, as you do. And then through the statistical analysis, because like well, everything else was before done by hand. And then the computer, it showed up neuroticism, extroversion, and openness. Oh, David Tennant plays Leary. Oh, brilliant. Definitely need to check that out. Anyways, and they identified neuroticism, extroversion, openness. And what Costa and McRae were interested in studying is let's say how personality changes across adult lifespan. And they published a really good book on it. But to them, what was interesting is let's profile 10,000 people now and 10,000 people in 10 years. And let's see what there's common changes of personality are. And this individual variance, let's discard it. Now, their tool, Neo, Neuroticism Extroversion Opens, uh, is quite popular and IP that's based on it is even more popular in academic circles. But the thing is that what they termed is your personality from age 30 is fixed as it is in plaster. So to them, when they look at this large data sets and common trends of how personality changes across adult lifespan, they're not particularly interested in individual differences of how personality changes for individuals. So to them, it was about large data sets and change of personality across lifespan. So then we go into 1980s and right here in Surrey, a man called Peter Saville, who actually before worked on 16PF and he was distributing and actually normed it, a new version for the UK population. And he saw quite a few things 16PF could be improved on. So it, he thought there might be an opportunity to do a very central and occupational based assessment of personality. So OPQ was born, the Occupational Personality Questionnaire. And it had quite a few facets. Now, you might be surprised why there is a bottle of milk here. Well, Peter, when he's asked by non-psychologists what he does, he says he's a milkman. Because he just cannot be asked explaining what's the world of psychometrics it is and that he built three seconds. <laughs> he's now building his third psychometric publisher. So that's 1980s. And then we arrive by the mid 1980s to the big five model of personality. Now, before we dive into deep five, um, big five, uh, is that a Freudian slip? I don't know. Uh, and would anybody like to mention anything about the previous tools? Why there OPQ, 16PF, NEO? Any thoughts, reflections? Yeah, Richard. Uh, yes, so uh, I just had a question. Uh, I think uh, Savile Assessments or Savile in the UK is a company and would he, uh, Peter Savile's assessments be the exact, trans the OPTQ be the exact translation that they're using in those recruiting companies? As so the thing with Peter, he's a, he's a fun guy. So first you had OPQ32, which was mm. released by SHL, Savile's and Holdsworth. It's a company he founded with a guy called Holdsworth. That's what SHL stands for, Savile and Holdsworth. Mm -hmm. Then there was a whole hoo-ha and um, they left the company, let's put it this way. And then Savile formed Savile Assessments, which formed the, Sa and he created Savile Wave. So that's the Savile Assessments. Then he sold that company and now he formed 10X. So that's 10X assessment. So Savile is behind OPQ, Savile Wave, and now 10X. Okay, thank you. That's all right. He also has a book coming out, which is quite interesting, all about his psychometric journey and life. It's a memoir. Any other thoughts or reflections? Yeah, Savile Consulting too. Mm -hmm. Right, so five is the magic number. 
You might have heard the song three is a magic number. Well, they were wrong. It's five. Well, for now, it might be six. We don't really know, but that's how you do with personality assessments. We evolve the theory as more knowledge comes up. It's a science after all. So basically, in 1980s, they proposed the big five model of personality. And then Costa and McRae went back and they were like, okay, we have neuroticism, extroversion and openness. And they were also proposed agreeableness and conscientiousness in the big five model. So Costa and McRae went back, updated their tool and they created NeoPIR, an updated version. Uh, it came out in 1985. And since then, it was a gold standard of personality. Then based on the big Neo, a tool called IPIB was created, which is for research and a few other tools like Facet5, Lumina Spark, and there's plenty of big five assessments out there. So now the whole idea is that this big five is formed by all that analysis that started in 1920s. So all this 18,000 words gravitate around these five factors. So you have yourself neuroticism, which is like all the words like anxious, angry, depressive, all of this floats around that. So N, basically there's a couple of traits people high on N share. So one of this is perception of threat, risk, and negative emotional affect. So it's basically people tend to feel more negative more often if they're higher on neuroticism. Surprise, surprise. But they also feel there's a higher risk uh, of things going wrong. So if you deal with somebody who's low on neuroticism, they might say, what are you worried about? The risk of this going wrong is one in a thousand. And a high neurotic will say, no, mate, it's 50-50. It will either go wrong or it won't. Then you have extroversion, which is positive emotional affect and need for stimuli. So people who are highly extroverted, they tend to be more positive. So the thing is that negativity and positivity actually exist separately. This is what's really important to know. So if a person is feeling like crap, telling them to cheer up doesn't work because you're asking them to be extroverted when they're being neurotic. And it's slightly different things. And so with extroverts, they also need more stimuli. So be it conversation, alcohol, coffee, anything. Then you have openness, which is curiosity and exploration. Agreeableness, which is attitude towards other people and importance placed on relationships. But even people with low agreeableness, they still have very good attitude towards people and relationships, but they're very selective. So they only kind of care about their inner circle, five to 10 people, not anybody else. And this is where this division comes from. So if a highly agreeable person, they worry about people in general vicinity. You know, they even worry about film characters, anything. And the person who is low on agreeableness can't really fathom why they care so much. Because they go, why do you care? They're not your family. And it's not like the person low on agreeableness is being mean. It's just that that's how they see the world. They can't understand why you're applying the same level of care to people outside of the immediate circle. And then you have conscientiousness, which is strengths of drive and purpose or grit or whatever you want to call it. Basically, people high on conscientiousness can do stuff they don't like for extended periods of time. It's a gift and a curse. Any questions about the big five? Right, so now what I would like you to do in Zoom, if you can go to annotate, so if you go to the little menu bar and click annotate, you can click little stamps, like little heart or a tick or a star. And what I want you to do is just place a star or a tick next to the aspects you most identify with. Just pick two or three. Oh, openness and neuroticism. Oh, a few of you in conscientiousness. Somebody just likes them all. Ah, oh, so nice. Uh, 
a big arrow towards positive. I love the circle and round neuroticism. It seems even a bit shaky, so it's perfect. So you have a nice little distribution. Quite a few on openness and curiosity, quite a few on conscientiousness. So it looks like we have quite a few neurotic openness and conscientiousness, which is an interesting combination to say the least. Perfect. One moment, there's something in the chat box. Competitive, where does that sit? Good question. It's usually correlated with lower levels of agreeableness and higher extroversion. So, Extroversion is slightly more about power and lower agreeableness is about personal success. Though people can be competitive if they balance a bit of a low agreeableness and high agreeableness is how we can compete together to beat the competition. So how we can come together to compete as a team. So it's always interesting to ask if people say, you know, I enjoy competitive sports. It's always worth asking which ones. Some people might enjoy, you know, tennis, and some people might enjoy football, the team camaraderie effect. Yeah, we'll definitely will be covering the sub factors and the traits. But before we do this, we're going to go a level higher. Because psychometricians have nothing better to do with their lives than do factor analysis. And when you factor analyze the big five, you get the big two, and you get the big one. So what are the big two? One is stability. So high agreeableness, high conscientiousness, and low N. And the other one is plasticity, high extroversion and openness. Now, you don't often hear about stability plasticity. They're also known as alpha and beta. But to me, the constructs of growth and fixed mindsets maps on nicely to this. And I think Dweck has a point, but I think we need to add the secret psychologist ingredient depends. Because if we look at growth and fixed mindsets, we assume one is positive, one is negative. And it doesn't give us the magic depends of psychology. So all I propose, we are the second layer. So we have effective qualities. Growth is really much plasticity. So it's high extroversion and openness. But stability, I call it, rather than fixed, I change it to nurturing. So you have the nurturing aspect which is high agreeableness, nurturing relationships, conscientious perseverance, and low neuroticism, staying the distance. So you have this nice combination. And you need both. That's what's really important. And both can be overplayed. Because yes, if you overdo nurturing, it becomes fixed. But same as if you overdo growth, it becomes chaos. So you have growth and nurturing, and then you have chaotic and fixed. So it's just to add that layer to the whole growth fixed mindsets. And um, another key thing here is to value both sides equally in whatever intervention you're doing, et cetera. Because plasticity is all about innovation and stability is all about implementation. And you need both for manifestation. So hopefully it will be cyclical. And this is just one of my pet hates when people say, you know, one's good, one's bad. Hmm. Thanks, James. One does try. It's so interesting that you describe a positive aspect of the low end of each, other than conscientiousness. Material success, what are the potential positives of low conscientiousness? Hey, Nigel, happy you ask. We don't do stuff we don't like. That's the benefit of low conscientiousness. And uh, yeah, high conscientiousness, another thing with conscientiousness, it's more correlated with success, as far as I'm aware, in highly predictable environments. Because it's actually conscientious people who really get to be in their bonnet when there's disruption to the process. Because if there's predictability, they can be conscientious and productive. But if there's disruption, that process is broken and they can't be productive. And it goes from you know anything which change and being a bit more conservative sometimes, especially if they're low on openness, high conscientiousness, low openness, 
correlated quite well between different political parties views, by the way. So if you want to research this, just type in Google Scholar, Big Five pol Politics, and uh, the right and the left. But anyways, I'm digressing. So if you high low openness, high uh, conscientiousness, a little bit more on the conservative side when it comes to change. But if, and it goes from politics to even something small as chairs. I read a study from Japan which looked at big five and different share preferences. And uh, funnily enough, it wasn't the low conscientiousness who praised comfort. It was high conscientious people. They loved those little elbow rests, which were comfy. And I was asking my conscientious colleagues like, what the hell, man? And, and they were, well, of course, because we don't want lack of comfort will impede our productivity. So high conscientiousness people care about predictability, comfort, in order to deliver. So when things change last moment, I don't particularly like it. But if you're alone conscientiousness, you can be quite innovative, opportunistic, think outside the box and be more com comfortable with ambiguity. Though if you ask your high conscientious colleagues, they'll probably say you're one of the sources of that ambiguity. But there is definitely benefits to that. Does that answer your question, Nigel? Yes, thanks, Nikita. That's all right. Any other questions about the big five or the big two? Big five is internationally. Oh, man. It's a very, very interesting question, Neil. So big five model, there's interesting stuff on this ability. Because as I mentioned with Costa and McRae, they said personality is stable and is set like it's set in plaster from your 30s. So there was not a lot of research on how flexible your personality is going or agile, as Emma puts it, um, because they thought it's set as it sets in plaster. And only at about 2010 or 12, which is like yesterday by psychometric standards, um, they started looking at dynamics of personality. It started with an article by Judge. Uh, Judge is a great guy, Timothy Judge. You can Google him right now and he has a beautiful website. Uh, well, it's beautiful from content perspective uh, where he puts up his articles, his presentation, PowerPoints, all of that. And the one that I'm referring to the article is what, like, who am I today is not who I was yesterday. So what they did, they profiled people in the morning with a big five tool Coffee and psychometrics, good way to start the day. Don't worry, it wasn't a big one, it was a short questionnaire. And then what they did is they profiled the person in the afternoon, how they felt at work, you know, extra citizenship behavior, all of the good stuff. And they found out that, of course, your personality predicted more how you felt than how you felt predicted your personality the next day. But they found that with one particular trait, you were more impacted by events at work in the afternoon the day before to how you self-scored in the morning. Any guesses which personality aspect those people who were more impacted by the events at work scored high on? Yes, Danny, in one, neuroticism. So people who are higher on neuroticism had bigger changes in their personality based on what happened, how they felt at work the day before. So people started scratching their heads and going, oh, this is interesting. It's, uh, we can research this. And so people have started researching the dynamics of personality and how people change and how we can stimulate this change. And we'll talk about this in lecture two and three, but basically as far as I understand, neuroticism is actually easiest to manage because let's say with proper sleep, diet, you know, cut down on social media, news, etc. you can pretty much bring down your neuroticism by let's say one standard deviation. So you can go from like being the most neurotic person in the room to like being one of the most neurotic people in the room or from, from one of the most neurotic people in the room to being like as neurotic as most. So you can definitely downplay it and go down the scale. But the irony is neuroticism is correlated with things like negative self-construct. People who are highly neurotic are really hard on themselves. So if you need to take care of yourself to bring down your neuroticism, it's a catch 22 because neurotics tend to feel they don't deserve to take care of themselves because of this negative self-construct. 
So if you're working with a neurotic client, they can definitely bring that down. But the irony is, is how you can override the feelings that they don't deserve it. Extroversion, yeah, I, I think that I, I would be quite, with neuroticism, I can see the reason why we want to bring it down a bit. But with extroversion, I always say, you know, an introvert is an extrovert with good taste because they're selective of what they're extroverted about. So they still socialize. They're just selective what they socialize about, with whom. They still get excited about talking about very particular subjects. And therefore it's, and you can dial it up, but you need energy for this personality changes and um, behavioral changes. So let's say if you're highly introverted, in order for you to socialize and talk to people, you will require energy. So make sure that if you need to present in a meeting, you know, you don't have meetings before, you go for a walk, get a cup of coffee, cup of tea, and um, you basically take care of yourself. And then you have a bit of decompression time afterwards. Similarly with extroverts, they might struggle with listening. So if they have somebody they need to listen to, schedule a meeting when you have energy. So you can definitely play with this. Openness, um, there's a few studies uh, which shown that you can increase your openness by doing things you like thought you'd never do before, creativity, etc., and substances, but that's a different topic, uh, which also has been shown to impact your openness, so psilocybin experiments. So recently, psychedelic drugs are back in fashion for research, for tr uh, treating um, treatment-resistant PTSD and depression, and especially in the States, like psilocybin, um, MDMA, and you can find this on Google Scholar or even the news. And what they found, they profiled some people with personality assessments before and after, a year after. And people's openness increased by one standard distribution. So, and this was consistent for a year. It might be consistent for longer. We just haven't, I haven't come across studies which studied it longer than a year. But to me with psychedelic substances, there's always a question, you know, was it the drug or was it that the people thought they'd never take drugs and they took drugs so they updated their self-construct? So there's, there's a few things. It's not necessarily the substance alone. Um, agreeableness is probably the most difficult to change. Um, but you can work on it. The good news is, is this is the only factor that keeps going up as you age. So we become more agreeable with time. Nobody actually knows why. So time is on your side. And conscientiousness, well, this is willpower. What's really curious about conscientiousness, it's most correlated with people managing their personality and being successful at it because they have more willpower for self-control. Does that make sense? Any questions about the big five? Right, so, I mean, this is one hour and 20 on personality. Could go in. There's only 10 minutes between now and coffee or alcohol or both. You don't need to as long as you're not driving. Um, so two factors of personality covered. And now just to finish up, I found a few slides of a model that tries to bring it all together. So type, trait, you name it. And that model is Luminous Spark, ironically enough. And basically the way it works is on neuroticism is sparked, but here you have the big five, such as low extroversion, introversion, high extroversion, extroversion, outcome focused, low agreeableness, people focused, high agreeableness. But here you also have the type. So how it might match up. So basically all of these models talk about quite similar things. It's just a different language. You need to be aware of the subtleties that they cover, but it's still quite similar. And this is something to be aware of. There's far more things which unite psychometrics and divide them. And here's a mapping of, let's say, plasticity and stability. And one time I was doing this mapping and somebody said to me, um, Ambiverts is a mix of extroversion and introversion. So if you use a bimodal model like this, which measures introversion and extroversion separately, most people will score a bit on both. Very few people will score high extroversion or high introversion. 
Some will, but very few. And then you have mapping of plasticity and stability. And when I was presenting this a few years ago, somebody, and I was thinking this is cutting edge stuff, they said, this is nothing new. Boy, did that hurt my ego, but I needed to remain professional. It was still morning, so I still had some willpower. And I said, what, what, what? And they said, this is just yin and yang. And I was like, uh huh. So I went and Googled it. And it seems pretty legit. So yin is all about, you know, the shadow, water, cold, gross, moon, and it can be overdone. So it results in being frozen. And yang is all about light, fire, heat, generating sun, and it can be overextended to chaos. And the whole principle of yin and yang, it's a, it's a mix of two. You know, we're all a mix of two. But I was curious is, you know, the, the start of one lies in the other. This is what's really key to me, because to me, I think introversion needs extroversion because if we didn't have extroversion, we wouldn't have any introversion, it'd be just it. So to me, the polarities of personality need each other. You need both sides because they give start to one another. Another key thing, it's always moving. I couldn't figure out how to animate it in Mentimeter. So my abilities are a bit weak on that as yet, but the whole thing, it's movement. And Another curious thing, we didn't go into it, but above the big two sits the big one. So above the two factors of personality sits the one factor. And we don't really know what the hell it is. But some people say it's social desirability. Some people say it's, you know, extroversion. Some people say it's how the positively the items are phrased. Jury is still out. What I find really interesting. So you have in the big five, you have big one, big five, no, big one, big two, big five, and lots of different facets underlying, which we'll get into in the next call. And then, with yin and yang, you have yin and yang, you have the true self above it. And then within yin and yang, there's five elements like wood, wind, fire, and earth. And what's really interesting is this, you know, it's all interconnected. And now we're finding personality in your genetics and in your blood and different analysis, how you behave to others, what words you use on Twitter. So what I really love personality for is that we have this long lineage, be it horoscopes, yin and yang, type, trait, disc, you name it. We've been grappling with this construct of defining ourselves and others for eons. And now we have this variety of tools that we can use as part of our practice. But that's enough for me. So, right, I'm just curious, what are your key takeaways from today's session? So if you can just go into menti.com, 67, 55, 44, 7, that'd be great. Yes, there definitely is. It was a little bit of a challenge to try to compress it to an hour. And I'm sure I missed quite a bit. Um, there were two cartels. I know, right? I was like desperately trying to find out if they were related. Psychometrics are really old. I can definitely, yes. Oh yeah, develop. I have 1.22 years until it's fixed. Yeah, actually my supervisor Wendy for my 30th birthday gave me a card and said, I guess this is it for you <laughs> as far as personality. Uh, Wendy was just so funny. I mean, uh, imagine this, and this is going back to the clinical point. Uh, we were going to our first business meeting. This is my first job. I'm going to the first big business meeting with my boss, right? And we sit down on the train. It's a sunny day. We're going to Bristol from Oxford, you know, idyllic autumn day. And she picks up and she goes, can you show me your Neo profile? And she looks at it, looks at me and he goes, and she goes, you are aware Nikita that this profile is associated with borderline disorder. And I go, uh. <laughs> and she goes, ah, don't worry. There's the most fun people to be around. Uh, so yeah, clinical psychologists are not known for their pep talks. Um, there's more flexibility, very happy for that. Oh, thank you. Ego needs love too. Right. So before we finish, there are three layers of personality, just as a little intro and uh, what we're going to cover next week. There's trait, behavior, what you do, and maladaptive. And this interaction between personality and context is what we'll talk about in the next lecture because we all manage a bit about ourselves. 
and we adapt to our environment. And that's what's really curious because it's not nature or nurture, it's nature and nurture. That's what's fascinating. And this is what we're gonna talk about. So I'm just really curious. Uh, oh yeah, we're also gonna cover a bit on 360 because can't resist. So is there anything that you would like us to cover in the next lecture about personality and context? Just anything in particular. So I have an, a week to integrate it into the lecture. So just type it in. So if personality change goes into it, personality development, anything you're curious about. Effects of aging, I can see that. Conflict between personality types. Mm -hmm. Would you un my, uh, mind unmuting yourself and telling us a little bit more about this? Hi, Nikita, it's Adam. Hey, Adam. Hi. Um, I'm just I'm interested in um, particularly personality in the context of teams and how, um, you know, different personality types overlap and interact and how that can sometimes create conflict. Mm. Yeah, I know. The, if I have a lot of diversity of personality in the team, I usually start the session saying, I have good news and bad news. Good news. You all have diversity of personality. So you all see the world slightly differently. So when you're presented with a problem, you can create all sorts of solutions for it. Bad news, you have diversity of personality. You all see the world differently. And as a result of this, you will get on each other's nerves. So yeah, it's, it's, how, you, it's how you leverage it. I'm a big fan of a guy called Ron Warren. He's um, created LMAP 360 personality assessment, has also a good book, Personality at Work. Um, and he basically says the role of a leader today is how you can harness collective intelligence of a group or a team and how you can facilitate that intelligence. And to me, uh, what knowledge of personality gives you is ability to facilitate that diversity of perspectives. Excellent. So we have a few more personalities and perception, key success indicators for assessment and selection, how personality and selection process. So there's a bit of selection, but we'll definitely cover that and how, what you need to be aware of, such as, for example, one of my favorite questions in selection going about personality and context is what aspects of your personality do you consciously manage at work and why do you think it's necessary to do so? And the question works quite well in selection and development. Oh, pharmaceutical treatment of depression and anxiety. I definitely need to read up on that. Attachment styles and personality in later adulthood. Ah, perfect. Well, I definitely have a lot to read up on uh, and to prep for the next week's meeting. So next week's meeting will be Thursday, 3 p.m., same Zoom link. And you can expect a link to this recording as well as a reading list. It's not really a list, just some of the articles and websites and curious anecdotes that I mentioned. Uh, will be sent to you via Eventbrite. So you can expect an email in the next couple of days. So feel free to use the same Zoom link. If you have a friend or anybody you think would be interested in this, feel free to share the details with them. The more the merrier. Um, yeah, that's about it. So thank you everybody for joining. So I'm just gonna switch off the recording, stop recording. Yeah.